Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to discuss the posterior cervical laminoplasty. This is an excerpt from a broader course in which we discuss the different types of cervical spine surgery. If you're interested in seeing the full course, we've left a link in the description. The posterior cervical laminoplasty is a very useful and powerful tool in a select population of patients. Before we talk about when we use it, let's talk about how we do the procedure. So this is a procedure that is done from a posterior approach. This is a neck looking at it kind of from the front. Once again, you can see normal range of motion in this model. This is a procedure done from the back. So the incision is usually in the midline up and down. This will give us exposure to the back of the spine, and you can see here the lamina demarcated by those red lines. Now, if you look at a slice of the spine like this, you can see how there's some pressure on the spinal cord and even some on the nerves, mediated by this ligament thickening here and kind of a small canal. So in this procedure, you make a full trough here and remove the ligamentum flavum on one side, but you make a small score on the other side. You don't necessarily make a full thickness cut and then elevate the lamina and the spinous process to decompress the spinal cord. Now, when you have that gap, you can see that you have to fill it, and I usually use something that looks like this with a little spacer made out of bone. That spacer is applied to a plate, and that little plate is secured using these small screws. On the outside, it's secured to the lateral mass and on the medial edge to the lamina, and that helps open up the spinal canal and expand the circumference of the spinal canal. Now, it can be done at multiple levels, and here it was say C4, you can see C3, three being expanded as well, just the same kind of opening up the lamina and the spinous process. And here you can do five and sometimes six. You can really do anything from three down to seven fairly comfortably, although I tend to do three to six primarily. This is a powerful technique for multiple levels, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But probably the single most salient characteristic is that this procedure preserves motion. So you can see leaning forward and leaning back. There's no structures kind of connecting up these levels, and we take great care to preserve the facet capsule, the ligaments, and the other structures in the back there. But you can see this preserves motion with flexion, extension, turning the head, and, and also lateral bending. So it is very powerful. In insofar as it allows for kind of moderate expansion of the spinal canal, but because you don't take any of the ligaments and any of the significant lig disco ligamentous structures, you can preserve motion with it. And so for that sense, it is, uh, it is very useful. So let's take a, a look at a situation where we might use this technique. Here you have a sagittal slice of the spine, and you can see how there's some mild degeneration here, but the spinal cord sits inside of the spinal canal here, and you can see how even just a little bit of degeneration can cause significant compression of the spinal cord. This is an axial slice over here where you can see that there's some mild ligament thickening and a little bit of disc degeneration, but all of that is crowding the spinal cord. And even though there's just a little bit of degeneration, this person has spinal cord dysfunction. So this highlights or illustrates really a unique situation called congenital stenosis. Congenital stenosis is a situation where people inherit a small spinal canal. So just like we all inherit different features, including like your, the size of your nose and the size of your ears and your height and other characteristics, the size of your spinal canal is inherited. It comes from your family. So some people are born with smaller spinal canals, and when that happens, even just a little bit of structural compression can be significant. So congenital stenosis is an inherited condition in which the spinal canal is structurally small relative to the spinal cord. So even mild degrees of degeneration or other structural pathology can cause significant cord compression. Now, congenital stenosis is one very unique situation where I think a laminoplasty is a perfect solution. Uh, if you look again at this axial slice, you can see how there's some narrowing. And you can imagine you just want to open up the spinal canal a little bit without committing this person to a fusion. Often we will encounter symptoms because you don't need a lot of degeneration. These patients can sometimes be younger. Now, when you look at what we do here, by opening up the spinal canal, by making a trough on one side and expanding it, kind of opening it up like a trap door, we've created some expansion of the spinal canal and some room for the spinal cord, all while preserving motion 
motion. And I think that's really the power of this procedure. When you do this procedure, this is what it looks like from the back. You can see here how the C4 level has been elevated, C5 has been elevated, C6 has been elevated. And it's really most useful when you're elevating multiple levels. Just elevating a single level, imagine it was still tight here and still tight there, wouldn't be that effective. You're really trying to open up the whole spinal canal throughout the cervical spine. Now, I will say I generally don't do the procedure with a laminoplasty at two, seven I will do, but you don't generally do it in the thoracic spine either. So it's really a procedure that is most valuable from C3 to seven, I would say. Those are the target levels in most patients when you do it. Now, if you look at the role of a cervical laminoplasty clinically and kind of break it down in a structured way, a laminoplasty allows for a decompression that is moderate. Right? You can't remove the full lamina because you're trying to preserve the capsules and the ligaments and stuff, but you can open up the spinal canal by a few millimeters, four or five millimeters, something like that is quite typical. It allows for moderate expansion of the spinal canal. It gives you some limited ability to do a foraminal decompression, especially on the side that you've opened up and done the full trough, not necessarily on the side that you've just scored because you're not really seeing the nerve root on that level. It certainly requires some degree of preservation of lordosis because when you do this procedure, you're not at all correcting the alignment. And the general belief is that if people have kyphosis, then a laminoplasty is contraindicated. And I think most people practice that. This is a procedure that's better for multiple levels. Really three or more levels is the lion's share of when we use it. Because it allows for motion preservation, it's a very powerful technique, but it's really best done from C3 to C7. Thankfully, that's where you see most spondylitic changes and most degenerative changes, so it ends up being versatile in that situation. It is not really clear what impact a laminoplasty has on neck pain. I think most people would argue that a laminoplasty is not a treatment for neck pain, but of course, no surgery is great for neck pain. Uh, the question of whether laminoplasties make neck pain worse or not is something that there's conflicting literature on. The paper that I know best is really one that was prospective randomized and really suggested that people had less neck pain with a laminoplasty than a fusion. So I don't necessarily think there's an absolute answer for that, but certainly a laminoplasty is not a treatment for neck pain. Now, in terms of the clinical indications, we talked a lot about congenital stenosis, and certainly that is a very good application for a laminoplasty. So that is congenital cervical stenosis with myelopathy, I think is a consideration for doing a laminoplasty. There is another situation which I think is very relevant as well. And this is a situation where maybe somebody doesn't have a congenitally small canal, but they just have a lot of degenerative changes with stenosis as a byproduct of that. You can still consider a laminoplasty in that situation, and I think the way to think about it is you have to have preservation of lordosis. It's not great if you have radiculopathy or certainly if you have neck pain, but really it's for myelopathy. So the kind of one-liner that you could consider an indication for it is painless cervical myelopathy with preservation of cervical lordosis. That is a very good indication for a cervical laminoplasty. This is a tool that most spine surgeons will or should have in their tool belt, but something that in the right patient can be incredibly valuable and powerful as a motion preserving way of decompressing the spinal cord. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.